Yo, what is up, guys? James Carter TV, and I'm here to talk about the 2014 NBA Draft and the players that I believe are the top 10 players in this 2014 NBA Draft. Now, this is the first year I'm really going into the draft because this year the draft has really piqued my interest, as I'm sure it has probably piqued yours because of the plethora of talent throughout the first round of the draft, especially at the top of this draft, making it very interesting, very compelling. And now I really want to go into this draft, break down this draft. Now, I've been doing that over the past three weeks, and I've come together with a mock draft that will be released uh, uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. Let me make a decision right now. It'll be uploaded on Tuesday, tomorrow. Come back tomorrow for my 2014 NBA mock draft, my one and only. I'm not doing many multiple mock drafts like what, what I do for the NFL. One and only mock draft, probably. And maybe I'll do one on Tuesday, and then right before the draft, if, you know, a, a team makes a trade, or something happens, and we know for sure that, okay, Andrew Wiggins is going number one, Jabari Parker is going number one, and I had that wrong, then I may make another quick mock draft with slight changes. But come back tomorrow for my mock draft tomorrow, okay? So come back for that. But now, top 10 players NBA draft. We're going to start from number 10. We're going to go to number one. <coughs> Let's start with number 10. We have Gary... Harris, the small forward, actually shooting guard. I, I, I project my shooting guard. Shooting guard out of Michigan State. Now, Gary Harris has what you like, a good combination of defense and shooting. And that is a combination that is very hard to find in this draft. Even though there's a lot of talent, a lot of these guys in this draft are, if they're really good at defense, then they can't shoot that well. If they can't shoot that well, they're not very good at defense. This guy has a good combination of both. Problem with Gary Harris is you wonder how much upside is here because he doesn't have great measurables. He's kind of undersized for the shooting guard position, which is where he'll end up being projected, unless if he could somehow play point, which I can't foresee. So he's undersized at the shooting guard position. He's not an elite athlete. He's an okay athlete, probably below average athlete at the position. Can't really finish at the rim. So you wonder... How great can he really be? He could be a solid starter, and that's why I have him compared to Aaron Afalo. By the way, I have player comparisons for each and every one of these players, and some of these players have a hybrid, a mix of some players. I have Gary Harris as an Aaron Afalo, OJ Mayo type guy. Well, he'll be a starter for you, but he's not going to be great. He'll never be great, but he'll be a good enough starter. He'll make somewhat of an impact, but you're not going to win games because of this guy. This guy could be on the worst team in the NBA. You won't even know. Okay, so Gary Harris, though, number 10, solid player. You know what you're going to get from him, number 10 on this list. Number 9. Doug McDermott, small forward out of Creighton. Now, a lot of people bash on McDermott. I've seen him rated as low as 18 on some big boards. But the fact of the matter is this. This kid can score. He can score from the NBA three-point range, which is farther than the college three-point range. He can hit an NBA three and hit it consistently. This kid took some deep threes at Creighton and made these shots consistently. You want buckets? There's a reason why they call this guy Doug McBuckets, because that's what he makes. He makes buckets. You know you're going to get that from him. His defense is a problem. It's his liability. It's his caveat. His Amarsha. He cannot play defense because he's not an athlete. He doesn't have lateral quickness at all. But if you can get him into a good defensive system, where you just tell him, okay, just switch in front of this guy. Just make sure you stay in front of this guy. Stay him away from bigs. I wouldn't get him near bigs, but if he's going up against LeBron James, he's going to get torched. He's going to get torched against LeBron James. But this kid can score, okay? Um, who did I have him? Um, well, I had him compared to Wally Sherviak. Now, for those of you who are that retro or Pedro Stoyakovich, more Zerviak than Stoyakovich, but also some Stoyakovich on him. Where these kids can score. Okay, Wally Zerviak scored 20 points a game early in his career. So did Wally Zerviak. Average around 20 points a game. 
but it never really impacted their teams too much. I mean, I know Wally Zerviak, I see Simi Fetch and the Kings, you know, they won games and all that, and that's nice. But it never really made a big impact, but they can score, and I think he can do that in this league. So I had uh, Doug McDermott right there at number nine. Number eight, and this is going to surprise a lot of you. I have Noah Vonley, power forward out of Indiana, and this may surprise you because I'm sure a lot of you will expect him to be much higher on this list. But the fact of the matter is, I'm not high on Noah Vonley. And I understand there's the measurables, okay? He's 6'9", 240. I know some people say 247. Eh, he's 6'9", 240, okay? He's built well, uh, you know, he can hit the outside shot, he had good start selection, but he didn't shoot enough, okay? The fact of the matter is this guy averaged 11 points a game last season, and that's a little worrisome for me, because, and, and I know the Indiana offense, I'm, I'm not very familiar with what that entails and what, uh, you know, goes on with that, but he kind of lacks that confidence, that kind of killer instinct that I'm going to get my points today, and I'm going to lead my team to success today. Now, he's a great rebounder. In fact, he's probably the best rebounder in this draft, and there's centers in this draft, for God's sake. But does he have that confidence and that leadership on the offensive side to make game-changing plays offensively? I don't know, and he also does not have a feel for the game. There was a play with this kid, I, I'm not sure what team he was facing, but he literally, no, there was no one behind him, and he caught the ball in the post. And for some reason, he thought someone was behind him, so he passed it right back to the point guard. This kid could have easily turned around and slammed it home. That's only because of a low basketball IQ and a low feel for the game. That's something that's hard to develop, and it takes time to develop. I would rather take in the guy who's number seven on my list, and the guy who's number five on my list, who played the same position. So let's move on to number seven. I have Aaron Gordon, power forward out of Arizona. Now, like I said, Aaron Gordon is the guy I'd rather take over No Von Lee, because I know what I'm going to get from Aaron Gordon right now. Aaron Gordon is a superb defender. Okay, that's the thing people need to distinguish. People are already saying, oh, he's Blake Griffin. Oh, he's Blake Griffin. Oh, and I forgot Noah Von Lea comparing to J.J. Hickson with a little more of an outside shot. Okay, anyway. Noah, um, Aaron Gordon. Oh, he's Blake Griffin. He's Blake Griffin. Well, Blake Griffin can't play this kind of defense because I think Aaron Gordon coming into the league will be a better defender than Blake Griffin. And I think Aaron Gordon has a mixture of Blake Griffin's game because there's the rare athleticism that Aaron Gordon getting at over 40 inch vertical at the power forward position is absolutely incredible. But I combine a Sean Marion and a Blake Griffin because of what he can do defensively. And he's Sean Marion, though under not as tall as Aaron Gordon, but as effective on the defensive side. I think Aaron Gordon, it becomes a mixture of a Sean Marion, Blake Griffin, not really with the Blake Griffin t kind of production. Somewhere in between. Somewhere in between the Sean Marion and Blake Griffin um, put, um production and their play styles. I think that's exactly where he's going to be. He's going to average 16, 17 points a game for a team, play quite well with some upside. There is upside here, though. But I think right there, that's why I projected. There could, he could be even better than that. So it's good taking a risk on this guy and saying maybe he develops more of an offensive game. But he helped. He averaged more than Noah Von Ley did last season. Again, a big problem I have with Noah Von Ley. So number six, though, I have Marcus Smart at Oklahoma State. Now, you have to understand where I'm coming from with this because I'm sure a lot of people will tell you that, oh, Marcus Smart, you know, he can't shoot and he's a tweener. And I'm tired of that. I need to dispel that. I will dispel that in a second. Um, and that, oh, you know, the incident at Texas Tech. Okay, let me tell you something. I love me some Marcus Smart. I'm a Los Angeles Laker fan, and if we draft Marcus Smart, I will be thrilled. Because this guy has the killer instinct that a lot of these NBA players nowadays are missing. This guy is tough, mean, and he's saying, I'm leading my team to victory today. Get on my back, because I'm leading us to the promised land. I'm Moses, you're my disciples, Lego, okay? He has that leadership mentality, and he is superb on the defensive end of the basketball. This guy averaged .7 blocks per game at the point guard position, and averaged uh, about 2.9 steals per game 
as well as averaging 5.8 rebounds per game at the point guard position. Just right there. Rebounds, assists, um, steals, and blocks. That's telling you he's doing the dirty work of the game. And the part of the game he needs to get down, though, and he already has the leadership and the intangibles, by the way. But the part of the game he needs to get down, though, is the shooting. Can he become a better shooter? But that's a small hurdle to pass because a lot of his problems is shot selection and his mechanics. Those are two things that can be fixed. And if he fixes that, then you have a truly great all-around point guard and a point guard that I love. And, I mean, Marcus Smart could really be something that we're at next level because he already is so good on the defensive side of all the dirty work and he already has the intangibles to me the best intangible leadership intangibles mean tough guy let's go mentality the guy you want your quarterback to be okay for your NFL pundits he has that the best mentality of all these prospects and that's big for me because I want you if I'm drafting you this high, because he will be drafted 8 overall or higher, I want you to be that guy. I don't want you to be a role player. No. I want you to be that guy, hopefully, and I think you can be. I compare him to a John Wall, who's also very good at that defensive side of the ball. John Wall also struggling shooting. They said Marcus Smart is not as explosive as a John Wall, but defensively and shooting-wise, you can see the comparison there. Smart number five, and this is all because of his injury. I will tell you right now, if this guy did not have this injury, he would be number one on this list, and that is Joe L. M. B. But today he rests at number five because of the foot surgery. He will miss four to six months, and this adds on to the list, the litany of injuries that Joe L. M. B. has had in his small career. He only played basketball for four years, and this guy's already having all kinds of health issues. I want to stay away from this guy until he reaches number five. Then I'm ready to take him. Thing is with Joel Embiid, though. I, I was saying Hakeem Olajuwon, Hakeem Olajuwon, and I see that. I see, though, also an early Hakeem Olajuwon, by the way. Early Hakeem Olajuwon, and also some, uh, also some Anthony Davis in there. I know that's a, a recent example, but there's some Anthony Davis to his game as well. I So... I mean, except I'm being more of a true center. That's why it's like Kim Olajuwon and Anthony Davis mixture that you're getting with him beating. That's one hell of a mixture. But can he stay healthy? He was dealing with a big back injury, an elongated back injury throughout the season. Can he stay healthy? And now he has a foot problem. It's a litany of injuries that I would not take in this draft. Not in this draft. Maybe in last draft, yeah, he's still number one overall. But in this draft where there's so much talent, one injury puts you down at the bottom because you weren't that far ahead of the other guys anyway. But now that this injury's happened, you're coming back a little bit, buddy. And that's what I would draw them be. But if I'm number five, Utah, I'm still taking him. Utah needs uh, Hakeem Olajuwon. My God, are you kidding me? Let's get one down in Utah. So let's move on to number four. And I have... <laughs> Julius Randle out of Kentucky. Now, this is probably going to surprise some of you. Uh, some of you probably expect him to be lower at, at this juncture, but the fact of the matter is to me is that Julius Randle, there's no foot problem. I mean, the foot problem, we all thought it was Julius Randle. Julius Randle has a foot problem, then I don't know where here comes Joel Embiid. Hey, I have the foot problem. Julius Randle, this guy is a tough, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Again, the tough mentality, especially at the power forward position that this guy has, he just beats you down. Now, the problem is with that, though. When he's facing bigger guys in the NBA, they may not work. He's going to have to get more of a, um, a more all-around offensive game. He needs to learn how to finish with his right. But I like the mentality of Julius Randle. And let's face it, this guy was a double-double machine at Kentucky. Double-double machine. You know you can get that production immediately. When he goes into the NBA, he has a very high basketball IQ. He's a very good rebounder, a.k.a. double-double machine. Can he develop more of the all-around game? But I know I can take this guy. I know I can take this guy, and I can get some Zach Randolph production out of this guy. And if you're telling me I can get that, I'm taking him, okay? I may not get the super, super, superstar, but I'm getting a goddamn good player. 
and that's still good enough for me. I'm getting a Zach Randolph type player that will be an integral part of a playoff team. And if I'm the Lakers, I'm sitting at number seven. Let's get this guy. Let's pair him with Kobe Bryant. And sure, it's only going to be for two years, but these guys could do something. Okay, so that's something I like about Julius Randle. Can he develop more of a post game though? Because, I mean, he's 6'9", 250. This guy beat down on the college competition. He can't do that in the NBA. He'll still do that, though. He'll still be pretty successful, but not as successful. Let's go on to number three, though. Do number three, Dante Exum out of Australia. He's an Aussie indeed. And this guy is Penny Hardaway. I mean, honestly, for those of you who are old enough to remember Penny Hardaway, this guy is Penny Hardaway. And not only the play styles, but the physical appearance. Penny Hardaway is 6'7", 199. Okay, and then Dante Exum is 6'6", 195. I mean, and then they have similar play styles as well. Anyone who is suggesting, because this is pissing me off. Anyone who is suggesting that Dante Exum is a shooting guard is an idiot. Because if you are suggesting such a statement, you really haven't watched this kid. He's a damn point guard. He models his game after Derrick Rose, for God's sake. He has the ball, he dribbles, he's excellent at doing the drive and kick, drive and dish. He's excellent at uh, finishing through contact sometimes, um, but great at finishing at the rim. Can he develop an outside shot and can he gain strength? That way he can be better defensively. Those are his two caveats right now, but those are two things you can fix, okay? And if you can fix those things, what a great player he could be, okay? So, but no, no shooting guard, no, 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 no. Enough of the shooting guard statements. It's ridiculous. Dr. Hickson, though, I'm a big, big fan of. He could fall all the way to number five. Uh, maybe number six, and right there, he'll be such a huge bargain. Uh, he's my number three favorite player in this draft. I think he could be great. All right, number two. Okay, you all knew he was going to be one and two. It was going to be some form of Wiggins, Parker, Parker, Wiggins. So let's say with number two, and I have to defend myself because I know there's going to be a lot of people talking shit. Number two for me is wingman because that's what he is, Andrew Wiggins. Now, I say wingman because he could be a shooting guard. Damn tall for a shooting guard because this guy's going to be 6'8", a shooting guard for some team. I don't know. Um, but I think he's going to be a small four, though, ultimately, though. But Andrew Wiggins, okay, great defender. That part of his game is good. You ain't got to worry about it. Consistency. On the offensive end, can he be consistent? Offensively, can he get the things done because... You know this guy has all kinds of potential. I mean, we've been talking about this kid since he was in 8th grade years. I mean, come on. Can he master his potential? Can he be consistent? Can he take over for a team? Because we haven't seen it yet. Because this guy scored 4 points in the last game for Kansas. Or something like that. Or, and he had another, like, dud game against Stanford. I, it was just absolutely ridiculous sometimes how Andrew Wiggins just, boop, disappears. And... He's missing that mentality. I, I talk about the mentality a lot, but it is. It's a big deal for me. I want you to have that superstar mentality. I'm going to take over the game. I'm going to win the game because that's the mentality that LeBron was missing for the first eight years of his career. And guess what? It took him eight years to win the damn title. Okay? I need that mentality, especially in this draft at number one or number two. I need that. He lacks that. And number one. Number two, though, I feel comfortable taking him because of his potential. Because he has the potential to gain that mentality, to gain that offensive consistency, and to gain that superstar uh, mentality. But he hasn't gotten it yet. Number one, Jabari Parker has gotten it. This guy has been profiled since eighth grade. He's been a Superstar in the Chicago basketball level, which is one of the best levels in the United States, in my opinion, the best level to go. I mean, honestly, high school basketball in Chicago is fucking intense. For those of you who don't know, and this guy, superstar at that level, he's been facing the best competition in the world since this kid was a little boy on the playground. He was facing the best. He knows what it's like to be a superstar. He has that superstar mentality. Sure, maybe he took a lot of shots at Duke, but you know what? I feel comfortable taking this guy when I know he put up over 20 points a game at Duke, 
and shot pretty well despite sometimes poor shot selection. So I said, come over here. Hey, fix up those shot selection a little bit, then you'll be all right. Like, all right. Now, is he a liability defensively? Yes, a little bit, but I think if you can get him in a good defensive system or surround him with some good defensive players, it won't be a problem. The thing is, okay, Wiggins has the defense. Parker does not, okay? But for me, and this is where the debate comes in, for me, though, I would rather take a guy I know I can trust offensively in this game, in this NBA game, I would rather take a guy I can trust offensively over a guy I can trust sometimes. And most of the time, not all of the time. I know I can trust Jabari Parker all of the time. I know what I'm going to get from him. I'm going to get okay defense and great offense. I know from Andrew Wiggins, I'm going to get great defense and who knows offense. That's not good for me. I want my sure thing. Jabari Parker, I compare it to a mixture of Paul Pierce, the good Paul Pierce, when he was in Boston averaging 24, 25, 26 a game, and Carmelo Anthony, okay? You're telling me I can get a Paul Pierce and Carmelo Anthony, get similar production out of them from the prize of their careers, or an Andrew Wiggins guy who could be, you know, uh, could be great, could be a Dominique Wilkins, could be... Uh, LeBron James, not really, but yeah. Or could he be more of a Paul George, which is what I project him to be. I think he's going to be a Paul George guy at the next level, both in play style and in production. But we'll see. We will see what happens. This is the NBA draft, a great NBA draft. Loving looking at this NBA draft. So what do you think? Top 10 players in the 2014 NBA draft. Tell me what you think down below in the comments. This is a very unorthodox list, I'm telling you. I've been looking at other people's big boards, just comparing. I don't change mine, though. When I make my big board, that is... Oh, wow. Excuse me. That is my big board. I'm sticking with my big board. That's it. My te top 10 players for the 2014 NBA Draft. Until tomorrow for my 2014 NBA Mug Draft, I'm out. Peace.